Wow, good morning. It is great to be together. It is great to uh, preach for the first time in shorts. It's my first time. Normally, normally Janice would not let this happen, but uh, since it's the church work day, he decided to be a cool boss, and so I get to preach in shorts. But for some reason, I can still feel Vince glaring at me from St. Louis, telling me to put on pants, but not today, Vince. But uh, it's our church work day, so we're excited for that. We're going to have lunch. We're going to clean up the building. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a blast. Uh, one quick announcement. Today is the last day to register for HYC and HKK. So if you have a child that wants to go to camp, today is the last day to sign them up. And if you want to be a counselor at either of those camps, today is the last day to sign up. So... As your youth and family minister, I just figured I should tell you all to sign up. So please sign up. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. That's June 11th through the 17th. And uh, yeah, we're going to have a blast. So uh, let's go ahead and say a prayer, and then we'll dive right into things. Amen? God, uh, thank you so much for this morning. Uh, Thank you for the buzz in the room. Father, thank you for the beautiful day. Just grateful to be here, uh, to worship you, to fellowship together. Thank you for the MIT students being here, God, and uh, them just getting to come and get equipped, God, and get trained so that they can go back and put in work in their cities, Father. It's just encouraging. Love to see it. And uh, God, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful that, uh, you know, we, we get to commune together, to worship together, God, to study out your word together. And grateful that we've been focused on this uh, beatitude of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Father, I pray that uh, as we get into the message here this morning, that our hearts would be open, that our hearts would be soft, God, and that you would inspire us. God, call us higher, challenge us, and help us to be more like your son. And it's in his name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. All right, so turn your Bibles over to Daniel chapter 3. And uh, just for context, so you guys know where we're at, uh, you know, our, our, our focus this month, the month of May, has been hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And so Matthew 5, verse 6 says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And uh, this past week, as I was working on this and and thinking about it and praying about it, you know, I I feel like the Spirit kind of led me to to focus on the kind of lifestyle that we can live if we choose to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And and one one of the things that I admire about influential people who have deep convictions is that they just don't seem to be swayed by whatever their circumstances are around them, right? Especially in a world where it's kind of just like you just go with the flow, right? Your your feelings, they're they're what matter most. So whatever you feel, that's what you do, right? And it's kind of hard to be righteous when you live by your feelings Uh, because sometimes, if we're being honest, your feelings are not always righteous. Uh, In fact, they're the, the exact opposite completely unrighteous, right? But people, I, people who, despite the, the challenges, right, people in scripture, influential figures, right, throughout history who just go against the odds and decide, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I feel is right, right? I'm going to do what I know to be right, regardless of what's going on around me. You just got to respect people like that, right? Guys like Martin Luther King or uh, Muhammad Ali, Abraham Lincoln, right, George Washington, some, some key figures in history who kind of have this notable reputation for doing the, the right thing even if it's not what's popular, right, even if it goes against the culture. And so today, you know, we're going to look in Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to look at these three men who had this same mentality, Right? They, they had the mentality that, hey, we're, gonna, we're not going to yield in our righteousness. We're going to do what we believe God has called us to do because we're hungry for it, because we thirst for it. Right? The, the righteousness of God is our priority, and no matter what, we will not yield, even if everyone around us decides to yield. And so the title of my message this morning is Unyielding Righteousness. And we're going to pick it up here in Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. And just to give a little bit of context about what's going on here. So the the Jewish people are in captivity. They messed up. They didn't repent. They didn't listen. 
And so God said, all right, you're going into captivity. So they are in Babylonian captivity. And uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, are actually favored by Nebuchadnezzar uh, because of who they are, because of their character, right? God, God is, is with them, and, and, and Nebuchadnezzar elevates them and gives them promotions um, above the rest of the Babylonian kingdom as well as the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people. And, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is an interesting king. He's known to be a man of justice, in a sense, but he has no interest or no desire about God. He doesn't care about the religion of the Jews. He is, in his mind, a self-made man, right? If, which you've read the book, if you've read the book of Daniel, you would know that. Um, but he has no desire or no interest in worshiping God. He has no fear of God. You know, there's no desire to please God whatsoever, or any God, for that matter. And so eventually he has this statue built in his likeness, and as a test of allegiance, he calls all the people in the nation to bow down and worship this statue. And so that's where we're going to pick it up here. Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. It says, At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Amen. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. What a boss moment. I mean, you just, I feel like you cannot read that and not be inspired. That's inspiring to me, right? I mean, you have, you, you have the, the, what they perceive to be the most powerful man in the world at the time giving you a command. Man, you, you got to worship this statue. You have to worship me. And imagine the scenario, right? As, as this statue is erected and the music starts playing, you look around and literally thousands upon thousands of people are bowing down, worshiping. But three people said, we're not going to do it. But put yourself in their shoes, right? Imagine that feeling, right? It, it just you, you look around and you see everyone falling and they're like looking at each other like, we doing this? Yeah, we're doing this. Like, we're in it, right? I, I think the, the courage that that took for these guys to remain standing while the entire nation bowed down before the king. Not even before the king, before this golden image. And they said, we're not going to do it. You know, I think about the kind of life that hungering and, and thirsting for righteousness produces. And, and the first type of life that it produces is a life of courage. When you hunger and you thirst for the righteousness of God, it enables you to live a life of courage. I believe that God gives us the courage that we need to do the hard things that nobody else wants to do. And I don't know what the faith or the religion was of the other people in the, in the, in the audience, right? I imagine they all had different beliefs. I imagine there were even other Jews in that, in that crowd who had the same you know, beliefs and, and religion as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were bowing down. They had decided, hey, we're going to bow down. 
We don't want to die. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had the courage to say, you know what? We're not going to yield. And, you know, even if it costs us our life, we hunger and we thirst for the righteousness of God so much that we're willing to give up our lives if it means that we hold fast to what we know to be true. I mean, it's such an inspiring and convicting example of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And it, it, as I read it, I just asked myself, man, do I have the same level of courage and conviction when it comes to God's word? Do I hunger and thirst for what I know to be true so much that I'm willing to put my life on the line? These guys did, right? These astrologers came forward, and, you know, they probably had some impure motivations. Uh, I imagine that the Babylonians weren't excited about Jews having power and authority over them. So they go to King Nebuchadnezzar, and they're like, hey, these guys that you promoted, they're not bowing down. So what are you going to do about that? And Nebuchadnezzar gets upset, and he's like, well, let me hear it from their mouths, right? He brings them before him. He questions them. You have the king questioning you, literally holds your life in his hands. Says, hey, I'm going to give you another shot, right? If you hear the music and you bow down, I'll let it go. I'll let it slide. But if not, I'm throwing you in the furnace. And they said, almost with an air of defiance, no, we will not, right? One, because we believe in God. We believe that God can save us, but even if he does not, even if he decides to let us perish, we still will not bow down. We would rather be burned alive in agony than to bow down to a false god. And Nebuchadnezzar essentially is putting himself in this position of God, right? And he says, no, no, no God can save you. I will save you if you do what I say. And ironically enough, the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments are, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And I believe that these commands were etched into the minds of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were like, oh, if we do this, we're violating the first two commandments. That's, that's a big deal. But they say, you know what? No, we're, we're not going to do it. They had such a great hunger for the righteousness of God that they were able to stand firm and full of courage. In a situation where many would yield. I mean, it's just being, just being honest, right? If, if a lot of people are in this scenario, in this situation, and they're put... You know, in a scenario where their life is literally on the line, most people would probably yield and say, like, uh, I don't know if I'm that committed. Or, mm, you know, maybe God will understand my circumstances, right? It's like, this is pretty intense. Like, he'll forgive me. But no, they said, we're, we're not going to do it. We're not going to bow. And I think that's what hungering and thirsting for righteousness does to a person fills them with courage to where they, they're able to do crazy things that no one else is willing to do. Nobody else was brought before the king. Of all the people there, only three remained standing. You know, when it comes to our lives, right, obviously I, I feel like the, the challenge for us, the implication of this is very apparent. How much do we hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God? And I think you can answer that question by asking yourself, man, how courageous am I to make a stand for God in this world where doing so is really not the move? You ask yourself, where's my courage? Or where's my level of courage? And, and really ask yourself, maybe ask people that know you, but how courageous are you in your schools, at your jobs, even in your own family? Are you willing to stand up for the things of God? 
See, I believe a person that hungers and thirsts for righteousness will be filled with courage. They will live a lifestyle of courage. And in the same way that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar expected all these people to bow down before this image, we're, there, there are things that we're, we're tempted to bow down to. Yeah. Right? Perhaps it's not some giant statue covered in gold of a person, but man, I, I feel like we will bow down for our own comfort. We will bow down for the things that make us feel good. Like, I'll, I'll bow down in a minute. To the point where it's like, even if it goes against what God wants, man, I'm going to bow down to this. And we don't always look at it as like, oh, well, I'm not bowing down to a statue. I'm not committing idolatry here, right? I'm not worshiping some false god. But it is possible that you can be an idol for yourself. It is possible that you can choose to prioritize the things that you think are best for your life over what God says is right. And I think we have to ask ourselves, who am I bowing down to? When the rubber meets the road, who do I bow down to? Do I bow down to God or do I bow down to myself? Or do I bow down to something else in this world? You know, we live in a world of, of relative truth and you do what feels true to you. And I, 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 don't, I hate to get on my, my soapbox again, but I hate it. <laughs> because I, essentially what that does is it, it just, people turn opinions into truth. And that's just not good. Even if you remove spirituality from it, there has to be some type of objective truth that is not that is not contingent upon people's feelings. Otherwise, the world would fall and descend into chaos. Like, the society just cannot thrive that way, let alone spiritually speaking. You cannot thrive spiritually if God becomes subjective to how we feel. But in this world that we live in, we've gotten so comfortable with creating idols for ourselves, making ourselves idols, that it just, now it's, No, 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 I know that the Bible says that, but that's not true for me. So I'm going to do this instead. It's just bowing down. You're bowing not to God. And and people will say, oh, you know, I'm I'm bowing down to God. No, you're not. You're really not. You're bowing down to yourself. You're worshiping yourself. And, you know, we we can be guilty of this, right? I mean, that's where sin comes from. Sin comes from a place of, I feel like this is better for me, so I'm going to do it. I'm I'm going to elevate what I want over what God wants for me, so this is what I'm going to do. Right, but it it takes courage to say, you know what, even even to ignore my feelings, and not to ignore your feelings, right? Feelings are important. They're great. God created them. Emotions are great. You need them, right? God has emotions, so I'm not saying that just because you have feelings, you're less spiritual. However... What I am saying is that if you allow feelings to dictate your level of righteousness and how you live your life, then you're not hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God. You're hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of yourself. And that cannot be. And it takes courage to go against that in a world where it's so common. You will rustle some feathers. I'm probably rustling some feathers in here right now. But I don't care. <laughs> the truth is still the truth. But it, it, it takes courage. And, and in order for you to have that courage, man, you have to be convinced that God's way is right. You have to be convinced that, man, God is the only way. He is the only way. The less, you con- the less convinced you are of that, the less righteous you will be. The less convinced you are that God's way is the right way, the less courageous you will be, the less convicted you will be, and the more you will blend in with the world around you. And you won't be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who stood up when everyone else bowed down. You'll be bowing down right there with them. And so I think we have to fight to see things the way that God does. What are those things for you? What are the things in your life that you're tempted to bow down to? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you're un, unwilling to be humble or meek. 
to get input, to let people into your life to help you grow spiritually. The world will say, no, you just don't, you don't need to let other people guide you or help you or call you higher. Just do what you feel like is right. That's a worldly way of thinking. Yeah. But being humble and asking for advice and submitting ourselves to other people, that's biblical. God calls us to do that. Or maybe you're unwilling to prioritize God over all else in your life. Man, something else is more important. Status, success. I want to be known for all of these accolades and accomplishments. I'm going to pour all of my time and my effort and my energy into that. The world loves that. Man, you be, go be a self-made man. Nebuchadnezzar was the same thing, right? If you read a little f- further on in Daniel, God made him eat grass like a cow. So, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious where that will lead you, but we can be tempted to do that. Chasing your own dreams or your happiness rather than chasing after Jesus, right? Not that it's bad to have goals or hopes or aspirations, but is Jesus the priority? Are you willing to sacrifice those dreams for Jesus? Or maybe you avoid doing the good you ought to do. Sharing your faith. Inviting people into a relationship with God, being a servant, giving, so on and so forth, right? Insert whatever thing so that you can conform to the patterns of this world. I think you've got to ask yourself, right, what is it that we bow down to? And it's something for everybody. There's a temptation for us to bow down to something that's not God. But in order for us to have the courage to do what God calls us to do, now we, we have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Man, we got to hunger for the word of God above all else, above all the other opinions and all the other thoughts and philosophical ideas and whatever else. The word of God has to be what we hunger for. And I believe when we do that, God will fill us with courage to take a stand, even when everyone else is bowing. You know, I love uh, our, our campus ministers, Nate and Hazel, there, there's some awesome people. There's some courageous people. I remember when, when Lydia and I were leading the campus ministry here, uh, Hazel would just stand up on tables and invite people to church to the point where I kind of, I, honestly, I kind of felt a little embarrassed. I was like, Hazel is, Hazel is doing the most right now. But I just think you don't, you don't do stuff like that if you're not convinced that God is God, right? And, and that God has what everybody needs to stand up on, on a table in a dining hall and shout at the top of your lungs, hey, come to Bible talk. You know, that's, that takes some courage. You know, I think about Nate street preaching on campus. In a world where people really, it, it almost seems like people just are turned off to Christianity. But to put yourself out there like that and go stand in speaker circle and just, you know, hey, I'm going to share the gospel with people. People that walk by, that takes courage, right? You do those kind of things that make you stand out. I think about KP, Kelly Paul, not, not Kevin Pekirin, and there's some, some tension there. But I think about Kelly Paul, right? She was converted, and she was a part of a sorority. And I remember uh, hearing people in her sorority share, like, oh, we know KP, because KP would invite everybody in that place to church all the time, to the point where I think they were annoyed. But... <laughs> The, the courage that comes from being so convinced that, man, I have something that you need. Yeah, that's right. And this is the right way of living. And you need it, right? I think that's what a hunger and a thirst for righteousness does. It puts you in a position where you feel courageous to do those things. So I want to challenge y'all, encourage y'all, man, what, how can you be courageous? What is something that you can do to be courageous for God? But in, in order to get to that point, we have to be convinced that God's way is the right way. Amen? Amen. All right, let's keep reading here. Pick it up in verse 19. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was, there, uh, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their heart and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. You know, it's just so cool to see, right? Because of their courage, it it led to God delivering them from this seemingly inescapable circumstance. Nebuchadnezzar went from literal favor to fury, right? He, He had... Originally given Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego this position and responsibility, and I I think he questioned them initially because he didn't want for them to have to die. I think he favored them. But when he saw their defiance and their unwillingness to submit, oh, he was mad. And I I think because of of, uh, his status, right, Nebuchadnezzar's status as king of Babylon, that's a bad look when you have people openly defying you. I think his pride was insulted. He goes, how dare my subjects don't yield to me? And so he gets mad. He's filled with rage. He orders the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than normal. And I don't know how this happens, but apparently it killed the men before they even threw them in there. That's how hot it was. But Nebuchadnezzar was upset. And so they get into the furnace, right? And uh, the Septuagint, which is the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, has an interesting account here, but it says that Nebuchadnezzar actually heard these men singing in the fire, which I thought was pretty cool. I'm like, man, that's, that's awesome. And then he goes back, and he's like, what's this singing I hear? And he sees four people instead of three, right? And he's like, I, I don't know what's going on here, but clearly their God is reputable. But what I love the most is that almost immediately, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges God. He looks, to, he looks into the furnace, he sees the four people, and he says, Son of the, or, or, uh, servants of the Most High God, which means that there's some acknowledgement, there's some submission in his heart that, okay, whoever it is that these guys are worshiping is real. Because I knew I put three people in here, but I see four, one of them looks like an angel. Um, some scholars believe that this was actually Jesus with them in the fire, protecting them. And so they come out of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar is amazed, is amazed, and he's just like, I acknowledge that your God is the most high God. And he acknowledges that there was complete deliverance to the point where their clothes weren't burned, the hair on their head wasn't burned, there was no smell of smoke on them at all. This wasn't like a barely escape the flames kind of a situation. This was, no, they were just in there singing, hanging out, having a good time with Jesus kind of a situation. And Nebuchadnezzar is left in awe. Like, oh, and he says, hey, no God can save or no God can deliver in the way that their God can. And I think that's what the second thing is, right? The, the, the life that we get to live is a life of deliverance. When we hunger and we thirst for the righteousness of God, and we, we, we hold ourselves to be courageous. We hold ourselves to God's standards, and we don't yield in our righteousness. 
Man, God delivers us in the same way that he delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I can't help but think that this entire story, right, is an allegory for future things. I mean, you have three men who are committing themselves to God. They're tempted to conform to the patterns of this world. And there's a fiery furnace that awaits them. Right? I, 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 I get hints of foreshadowing of hell and, and God saving those that are faithful and, and righteous and holding to his commandments, right? I don't think this is just in here for no reason. Man, because when we, when we yield, when we choose not to hunger and thirst for righteousness, and we choose to cower in fear rather than be courageous and to conform to the rest of the world, is there not a furnace? Is there, uh, hell is real. It is, and I know it's uncomfortable to talk about. I, I know that the world would love to just focus on the love of God, which, amen, the love of God is awesome. It's his best quality, but we cannot neglect the wrath of God. We cannot neglect the fact that there is a fiery furnace prepared for Satan and his demons and all those that choose to cast their lot with him. It's real. But for the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness and the one who is courageous, there is deliverance. And it can only come through God. Salvation is only found in God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose to trust in God, chose to hope in him, chose to hold to the righteousness of Scripture, and God delivered them. And every one of us in this room needs deliverance. And we don't just need it once. We need it every day, sometimes multiple times a day, right? Oftentimes, right? We need it multiple times a day. But it can be found only in Jesus. What do you need deliverance from? What are the things in your life that are choking you out? Right, the same things that are, are, that are tempting you to bow down. We need deliverance from those things. From sin, right? We, we need deliverance from sin. God is the only one who can deliver us from those things. But I think what is, is easy to do is we, we turn to other things that aren't God. Looking for deliverance. We need deliverance from sin, but we can turn to sin. Looking for deliverance. We could turn to our relationships, our friendships, our significant others, whatever. Trying to find deliverance from the hardships of life and the way that another person makes me feel. Or work, or yourself, whatever, right? We, we can turn to all kinds of things looking for deliverance. But if we... Unless we look for deliverance from God, then we won't be delivered from hell. If deliverance, if we're trying to find it from somewhere else that's not God, no, the, the, the fiery furnace awaits us. And I think that's something that we have to always be mindful of, right? It's not a fear tactic. It's not trying to scare us into being righteous. But I do think we need a, a sober and healthy perspective of what's true. You know, I think that uh, Jesus' words at the end of Matthew 28, verse 20, are so comforting, right? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I think that's so cool, right? He was, he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And by the way, it was literally Jesus or not. It, it was God intervening, right? We, we can't deny that, but he was with them. And I, I think for us, as we strive to live lives of righteousness, man, God is with us. And if you've become a disciple of Jesus and repented and been baptized, God is within you. The Holy Spirit lives within you. He doesn't want to spare us, right? God doesn't always spare us from, from hardships and persecutions. Sometimes life is hard. But at the end of the day, I think if we could hold on to the fact that, man, God is going to deliver me from his wrath, it'll, it'll encourage us to press on. It'll encourage us to hold fast to what we know to be true. And, and this deliverance, I find myself more and more in need of it day after day. You know, just to be open with you guys, uh, you know, Friday I got into sin. I had a fit of rage. I got into a fight with my wife. 
and I got really upset. For those of you that don't know, I really struggle with anger. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal in my life, and I'm working hard, trying to dig deep, trying to repent of it, but I just, I, I had a fit of rage, and I, I, you know, we were arguing, and I was like, I just need to leave, and so I left the house, and I wanted to hit something, and I didn't want my kids, my kids were in the living room watching TV, shout out screen time, um, but they were in there watching TV while she was cooking dinner, and, you know, I was like, I don't want them to see me angry, so I just left the house, and I was pacing, and I was trying to calm down, but my fist just balled up, and I just punched this plant that we had hanging, and the dirt just spilled everywhere, and it got in my hair, and it was a Mother's Day gift that Mindy had bought for my wife, and, you know, I just felt like, gosh, like I'm a slave to my anger. I felt like I need deliverance from this, and and, and honestly, in that moment, I felt like there is no hope. And I was thinking of what can I turn to to find deliverance from this, right? Like what, uh, I want to go veg out or, you know, I want to go, I don't know, I just want to do nothing. I just want to unplug and not talk to anybody. Uh, But I was like, I can't do that. So I called Janice and I was like, Janice, I'm mad. And, you know, Janice is, Janice is never mad for some reason. He (laughs) always seems to have a level head. And so he... He kind of talked me down, and he actually helped me to see my own sin. And I was like, ah, yeah, you're right. But, but I, I felt like after that conversation, you know, choosing to do things God's way, it, it led me to feel hopeful. Yeah. And I felt like, okay, like I, I see where I can grow. I see what I can do to work on myself and, and grow and repent of my anger. But I felt like I wouldn't have gotten there if I hadn't chosen to submit to doing things God's way to confessing my sin and to, to getting input and getting help from somebody in my life who was helping me to grow. And I feel delivered. You know, am I, do I still struggle with anger? Yes, I do. And I, I, I've still got to take steps every day to deal with it. But I feel like it doesn't have a hold on me. Amen. And that only is the case because God is right, right? God's way of doing things is right. And so I would encourage you, whatever you feel like you need deliverance from, whatever you feel like it is that's, that's got a grip on you or is keeping you from living the life that God is calling you to live, man, get help. Ask somebody. Submit yourself to the way that God calls you to do things. Amen? You know, to, to wrap this up, guys, uh, just a reminder about our, our practical for the month uh, is our, our righteousness slash repentance plan. And so I, I think this is a great opportunity, right, for us to, to really look at, okay, what is it in my life that I need to repent of? How am I being unrighteous, right? Being intentional about those things so that we can't hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. And it builds, right? In order for us to be convinced that God's way is right, we first got to be poor in spirit. We have to acknowledge that, man, I, I have nothing without God. Right? We have to be meek. We have to, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We have to, to mourn. Right? we got to do all of these things. And then here is where we could put it into practice. Man, how can, I, how can I hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God? And so that's what your righteousness plan is. That's what the repentance plan is. But let's remember, right, because of their unyielding righteousness, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to impact an entire nation. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar openly proclaimed in front of all of Babylon, no God can save like their God can. And imagine the impact that you could have in the lives of the people around you if you choose to be unyielding in your righteousness, right? If you choose to be courageous and to take a stand when no one else wants to, and if you choose to look to God for deliverance and no one else. And I believe when we do those things, we will experience truly what it means to be filled. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Hello. Uh, thank you, Davion. That was just an awesome sermon. I was uh, sitting down and thinking about, like, what do, I, what do I bow down to, right? And I think, like, people, like, people or people of authority, you know, just to kind of avoid conflict or to... Yeah please people, right? And I love, I love the point where you said uh, to hunger and thirst for righteousness is to, uh, 
you know, sometimes you have to forget your feelings or like leave them behind, you know, and, and so I would do those things because I, I don't know, feel bad or like, like Ugh, I don't want to, you know what I mean? I just want to keep it level, right? And so to, I don't know, really, yes, hunger and thirst for righteousness. I need to like forget my feelings and stuff like that. And so, yeah, it was awesome. And we need deliverance from God and Jesus. And so I'm going to pray and we have one more song. Dear Heavenly Father, just um, thank you for this day today, God. I pray that uh, we can really just embody uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God, that we can really just take a stand for you, God, in our, in our lives day to day, and that we can, um, yeah, just, I don't know, be willing to sacrifice our lives for you, God, and to really uh, do that. And so, God, I pray for the work day as well today, that uh, we can just get a lot of work done. And in Jesus' name I pray.